Daily Scripture and Meditation with Shirley Sedis Jackson. We begin, as always, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friday, the 24th of September, 2021, is the 25th week in Ordinary Time. Laudate, our daily prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe and I profess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Take my life, my will, and all that I have, that I may be fully yours now and forever. Amen. Magnificat, daily scripture, but first an overview. The experience of being with Jesus leads Peter to this judgment. He is the Christ of God. But this Christ must suffer greatly, be rejected, be killed, and be raised. That event will shake the heavens and the earth. For those who join in Peter's profession, the Lord replies, Take courage, for I am with you. One moment yet, and I will fill this house with glory. A reading from the book of the prophet Haggai, chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the twenty-first day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Tell this to the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, son of Shethiel, and to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, and to the remnant of the people. Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in your eyes? And now take courage, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and take courage, Joshua, high priest, son of Jehoshaphat, and take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. This is the pact that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit continues in your midst. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, One moment yet, a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Mine is the silver, and mine the gold, says the Lord of hosts. Greater will be the future glory of this house than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give you peace, says the Lord of hosts. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 43 Hope in God. I will praise Him, my Savior and my God. Do me justice, O God, and fight my fight against a faithless people from the deceitful and impious man. Rescue me. For you, O God, are my strength. Why do you keep me so far away? Why must I go about in mourning, with the enemy oppressing me? Send forth your light and your fidelity. They shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then will I go in to the altar of God, the God of my gladness and joy. Then will I give you thanks upon the harp, O God, my God. Hope in God. I will praise him, my Savior, and my God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Son of Man came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. You are the Christ of God, the Son of Man must suffer greatly. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 9 verse 18. 
Once, when Jesus was praying in solitude and the disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, one of the ancient prophets has arisen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said in reply, The Christ of God. He rebuked them and directed them not to tell this to anyone. He said, The Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and on the third day be raised. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Magnificat Meditation of the Day is entitled, Who Do You Say That I Am? That Jesus is a man-God does not mean that God has been transformed into a man. Rather, it means that the divine person of the Word possesses not only the divine nature, but also the concrete human nature of Jesus the man. This method of saving us responds magnificently to a. man's nature which needs sensible reality and b. the dignity of human freedom inasmuch as God takes it on as a collaborator in his works. The difference between the Catholic Church and all the other Christian conceptions and interpretations springs precisely from its consideration of this method. This extends throughout history. If such an exceptional reality intervened in history, adherence to it must be possible for everyone always. And look, I am with you always, yes, to the end of time. To adhere to the method indicated by the Incarnation implies that man is called to follow the same proposal of salvation at different times, in different circumstances. If Jesus came, he is, he exists, he remains in time with his unique unrepeatable claim and he transforms time and space, all time and all space. And so, defended by those who had verified its credibility by pledging their lives, the fact of the Incarnation, this inconceivable Christian claim, has remained in history in its substance and entirety. A man who is God and whom man must follow if he is to have true knowledge of himself and all things. The task of the Christian is to fulfill the greatest function in history, to announce that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, is God. It is an event which was announced throughout the centuries and which reaches us even today. The task of the Christian is not only the greatest, but also the most tremendous in history. This meditation was written by servant of God, Luigi Ghisani. Monsignor Ghisani died in 2005, was a priest of Milan, Italy, and founder of the ecclesial movement Communion and Liberation. Laudate, Reflections and Actionable Challenges from Our Scriptural Readings Introductory Prayer Lord, you are the author of life and the giver of all that is good. You are the Prince of Peace and my mainstay. You are my healer and the cure itself, and I need to give you. I love you and commit myself to you entirely, knowing you could never let me down or deceive me. Thank you for giving me your very self. Amen. Our petition for the next three challenges. Lord Jesus, strengthen my weak faith and guide me along your paths. 
our first challenge, blind faith in science. There are so many everyday things that we take for granted. We have a certain blind faith in them. The electricity in our room, the engineering feat of the skyscraper we work in, etc. It just comes naturally to us. We don't put much thought into it. We trust that they will continue to work. Unfortunately, when our faith crosses the line of empirical knowledge, like electricity and engineering, into the realm of the spiritual, we can find obstacles to our believing. Challenge number two, supernatural faith. Understanding of what our Lord states about His passion and death in today's scripture can only be obtained through a supernatural faith. This gift is a gift we must seek from God in all humility, so that it will shed light on the whole of our lives. It will bring a knowledge greater than just a purely human one. Trusting in Jesus, let us ask Him for this faith. Challenge number three, afraid to ask. The disciples in today's gospel passage were afraid to question Jesus. Questioning something we do not understand is not necessarily bad. It is quite normal and reveals a childlike attitude. Christ always has an answer to our questions, an intelligible answer even though our minds may not fully grasp its breath. In fact, Christ does not want us to accept his teaching and values in a passive way. He wants us to accept freely, not so much because we understand fully, but rather because we trust and love the God who reveals himself to us. Our Conversation with Christ Lord Jesus, it is so easy for me to look at life from a purely human standpoint. Grant me the eyes of faith to see all things from your viewpoint. May my faith enlighten my path all the days of my life. Our Resolution In my prayer today, I will beg, in all humility, for the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. Meditation Who is Jesus for you and what difference does he make in your life? Many in Israel recognize Jesus as a mighty man of God, even comparing him with the greatest of the prophets. Peter, always quick to respond whenever Jesus spoke, professed that Jesus was truly the Christ of God, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. No mortal being could have revealed this to Peter, but only God. Through the eyes of faith, Peter discovered who Jesus truly was. Peter recognized that Jesus was much more than a great teacher, prophet, and miracle worker. Peter was the first apostle to publicly declare that Jesus was the Anointed One, consecrated by the Father, and sent into the world to redeem a fallen human race enslaved to sin and cut off from eternal life with God. Luke 9.20, Acts 2.14 The word for Christ in Greek is a translation of the Hebrew word for Messiah. Both words literally mean the Anointed One. Jesus begins to explain the mission he was sent to accomplish. Why did Jesus command his disciples to be silent about his identity as the anointed Son of God? They were, after all, appointed to proclaim the good news to everyone. Jesus knew that they did not yet fully understand his mission and how he would accomplish it. Cyril of Alexandria, who lived from 376 to 444 AD, an early church father, explains the reason for this silence. Quote, there were things yet unfulfilled which must also be included in their preaching about him. 
they must also proclaim the cross, the passion, and the death in the flesh. They must preach the resurrection of the dead, that great and truly glorious sign by which testimony is borne him, that the Emmanuel is truly God and by nature the Son of God the Father. He utterly abolished death and wiped out destruction. He robbed hell and overthrew the tyranny of the enemy. He took away the sin of the world, opened the gates above to the dwellers upon earth, and united earth to heaven. These things proved him to be, as I said, in truth, God. He commanded them, therefore, to guard the mystery by a seasonable silence until the whole plan of the dispensation should arrive at a suitable conclusion." Unquote. God's anointed Son must suffer and die to atone for our sins. Jesus told his disciples that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and die in order that God's work of redemption might be accomplished. How startled the disciples were when they heard this word. How different are God's thoughts and ways from our thoughts and ways. Isaiah 55 8 it was through humiliation, suffering, and death on the cross that Jesus broke the powers of sin and death and won for us eternal life and freedom from the slavery of sin and from the oppression of our enemy, Satan, the father of lies and deceiver of humankind. We too have a share in the mission and victory of Jesus Christ. If we want to share in the victory of the Lord Jesus, then we must also take up our cross and follow where he leads us. What is the cross that you and I must take up each day? When my will crosses, does not align with God's will, then his will must be done. To know Jesus Christ is to know the power of his victory on the cross, where he defeated sin and conquered death through his resurrection. The Holy Spirit gives each of us the gift and strength we need to live as sons and daughters of God. The Holy Spirit gives us faith to know the Lord Jesus personally as our Redeemer, and the power to live the gospel faithfully and the courage to witness to others the joy, truth, and freedom of the gospel. Who do you say that Jesus is? Lord Jesus, I believe and I profess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Take my life, my will, and all that I have, that I may be wholly yours, now and forever. Amen. Further meditation entitled, Construction Workers. Quote, Greater will be the future glory of this house than the former, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai 2, 9. After the temple had been destroyed for 67 years, the Israelites returned from exile. Following 17 more years of seeing the temple lie in ruins, the Lord raised up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah 6.11 to command Zerubbabel the governor, Joshua the high priest, and the remnant of the people to get to work. Haggai 2.1 Four groups of people were necessary for the rebuilding of the temple. If we are to rebuild the church, we will need these same four groups of workers. First, we need prophets to tell us what God is saying. Without them, we don't know what work to do or when to do it. Without prophecy, the people become demoralized. Proverbs 29, 18 After the prophets tell us what God wants, we need, second, civil officials who do not play party politics, but who come under the Lordship of Jesus. Next, or third, we need priests who will rebuild the church by 
fearlessly proclaiming our need for repentance and salvation. And finally, fourth, we need the remnant of the people to do the work of rebuilding the church. The remnant is not just the leftovers, the few remaining people in a time of eroded faith. They are prophetic, called by God, uncompromised with the world, and totally committed to the Lord. With two prophets, several righteous politicians and priests, and members of the remnants, we have the workers needed to rebuild the church. Our Prayer Father, make me another St. Francis of Assisi. God's Promise to Us Send forth your light and your fidelity. They shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Psalm 43, 3 Thomas A. Kempis quote from the Imitation of Christ, Thou, O Lord, art always the same, and endurest unto eternity, ever good, just, and holy, doing all things well, justly, and holily, and disposing them in wisdom. We are God's hands, feet, and voice. May his peace rest upon you as you go and announce the gospel of the Lord in your words and deeds. Thank you for joining today. Abundant blessings upon you and yours. Amen. We close as always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.